A few years ago, Alan Fanlin, author of a wonderful little book entitled Unhurried Living, traveled with his wife, Jim, to St. Petersburg, Russia. They had many duties of their job at the time to go to various parts of Russia, but they particularly wanted to go to St. Petersburg to see the world-famous Hermitage Museum. This world-famous museum has 3,000 million pieces in their possession, and they only put out a few pieces at a time because it would take several days to see everything in that multi-layered museum. As you can imagine, the amount of beauty and craftsmanship was overwhelming. As they rounded one corner of the museum, they entered a room completely devoted to Rembrandt's paintings. And there it was on his very own wall, the famous prodigal son. Needless to say, it was something. They waited for the crowd to clear so they can get a close-up view for themselves. And as you know, the prodigal son is a masterful work of art depicting biblical and theological truths that the father never gives up. He is always waiting for us to come back home, that the father is generous and merciful, that he loves us. And as they made their way slowly through this rest of the room, they came upon a section of paintings entitled Rembrandt Students. The works were created by those Rembrandt had taught, that mentored, and what was amazing to the untrained eye was the lighting and the colors and the style appeared to be identical to Rembrandt himself. Of course, the word apprentice flowed through their mind that one is trained so well by the master that the work is indistinguishable from his. One of the interesting things is that many of those works were actually debated, were they Rembrandt originals or were they actually done by the students? That's a great question, isn't it? That is, how can we live our life as lives as servant leaders that are so indistinguishable than from our mentor, Jesus Christ? After all, we're apprentices. Now, I need to necessarily be brief, but I want to share with you seven servant leadership transformative practices if you truly want to be indistinguishable from the master. The main biblical text most people use about servant leadership is found in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, where Jesus tells um, his disciples that I've come not to be served, but to serve and give my life a ransom for many. But I want to focus on a text that's found in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. In fact, if you want to think about the book of Romans, which you begin to realize, Romans chapter 12 through chapter 16, it's really a treatise on how to become an effective servant leader that's indistinguishable from his master. You and I know the book of Romans as being a Christian manifesto. I mean, Martin Luther proclaimed its greatness. So did Augustine. Calvin said everyone should, if they want to know the basics of the Christian life, you really need to read the book of Romans. And indeed, you should. The first three chapters is about sin and our ruined condition that we have in life. Chapters 4 and 5 are about our salvation and what we need to do to be justified by faith through Christ Jesus. And then in Romans 6 through 8, he moves from sin to salvation. He begins to talk about sanctification. How do we live empowered by the Holy Spirit and live securely in that life? And then Paul turns in Romans chapter 9 through 11 and talks about God's sovereignty based upon his multiple mercies. And then finally, when you come to Romans chapter 12, he takes everything that he says. That's why he, he uses in the Greek word, therefore, a very first word in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters. It's the first time he actually uses the word brothers and sisters in the entire letter. And the reason being it was there was racial problems that were going on with the church Five, six years earlier, the Jewish people were banished from the city of Rome in the name of Christ. All the protest and all the violence that was taking place. And they only recently came back after two years. And many of those Jewish people were Messianic Jews. They were people that received Jesus as, as their Savior and Lord and saw him as the Messiah. When they started the church in Rome, they were the people that were entitled. They were the ones that started the church. And few Gentiles were Christians. But after they were banished, the Gentile Christian population grew in the city of Rome. 
And now the Jewish people came back and they were no longer the leaders of that community. And a great battle came on and inequality came on and Paul was addressing that, saying that we're all under sin. There's only one way to be saved through Christ and, and sanctified through the power of the Holy Spirit and God's sovereignty is his multiple mercies that he has. And so in Romans chapter 12, verses one and two, it lays the groundwork for you and me in terms of those seven transformative practices. Let me read to you the passage. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, he's talked about that all the way through the first 11 chapters, to present your bodies. It's an aorist tense, and the idea is that it's a one-time ability that you have to present your bodies with continuous action that happens in that event, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. We talk about a great deal about dedicating our hearts to God. But here Paul says the very first thing that we must do as a servant leader that seeks to transform our work in such a way that's indistinguishable from our masters is that you and I have to present our bodies before God. And that leads to the first principle. That if you want to be a servant leader that's indistinguishable from the master Jesus Christ, you're going to have to create strategic margins in your life and work. That you and I are going to have to be committed to living a new kind of life. Because the nature of leadership is influence and the only way to be influential and persuasive is to be believable. And to be believable, you have to be focusing upon the truth, reality. And reality is always found in Jesus Christ. So you and I need to create these strategic margins so that we're able to dedicate our whole life before God. But let me just talk in a business sense. Creating these strategic mar margins in life and work are essential. Most people think that the genesis of any innovation happens in the workplace. That's not true. Actually, most of the times innovation takes place are through the margins. Neil Bohr, in, his, in the book, The Making of an Atomic Bomb, would get stuck on a physics problem for months and even years. And working tirelessly, he finally took a vacation, and boom, metaphorically speaking, the solution would come. The idea of television didn't come from a laboratory. It came when someone was plowing a field. Netflix was cooked up at home. The post-it notes actually emerged from church in a choir loft. The idea of Harry Potter came while J.K. Rowland was stuck on a train. The idea of barcodes came at a beach. The prolific writer Arthur Andrew LeBeau writes, away from the pressures of the office, the classroom, the home or the laboratory, where the left brain focusing on reason, logic, and problem solving is working on overdrive, the right brain, where ideas often come from, can't get a word in edgewise. But on vacation, on a break, in a shower, in a new environment, the right brain has a chance to rise to the surface and contribute. And the result is a beautiful thing. The first practice that you and I need to do if we want to be indistinguishable from the master is strategic margins. Jesus did that. He ministered and he went away from the group to have these margins. The second practice that needs to be done, and it's a very important practice and ties into Romans chapter 12, verse 2, is that a person who wants to become a transformative servant leader needs to place a higher value on significance than success. In the second verse of Romans chapter 12, it says, do not be conformed to the world. Don't get squeezed into this world, but be transformed. That's where we have the word metamorphosis. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Our mind is so critically important in living like the master 
Jesus was always following and doing the will of the Father. His mind was set upon the task, and through all the scriptures, it talks about us having the mind of Christ. The mind is something that is so powerful that it creates images and information and grants us the ability to think. The mind is where thoughts and feelings originate. We actually get to choose what we want to think about, and which in turn affects our emotions. And that's why people are so affected when their emotions are so tied to their thoughts that they're unable to mo remove their feelings often from their thoughts and are become unreasonable because of that. It is the main primary attack that Satan has upon us is the mind. But to change governing ideas, to change the kingdoms of the world's philosophy that is there, you have to have the mindset of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is always committed to significance over success. Always. We saw that in the life of Jesus Christ. And when you look upon his life, you begin to see that he wasn't very successful in terms of the world's term, was he? In fact, when he died on the cross, it was the worst possible death that one could have. It was filled with shame. When he taught us to be a servant by washing one another's feet. That's the worst thing in the world's eyes to do. That's not a successful move. But Jesus values significance over success because he knew that success ebbs and flows. Significance lasts. He knew that success ends the day you die, but significance carries on. He knew the human beings that in human beings that success is never enough, but significance satisfies the soul. If you want to be just indistinguishable from the master as a servant leader, you need to always value significance over success. The third practice that we need to have is that we need to model inclusivity because we honor the dignity of all. It's interesting to me that the word dignity comes from the Latin that means worth. And not worth in a monetized sense, like the worth of a building or a worth of a computer, but the idea that worth in the personhood of an individual because they are made in the image of God. Remember that grand picture of heaven in Revelation chapter 4, verses 9 and verse 10, where God has purchased with his blood every tribe and every tongue, people, and nation? to make them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. That's inclusivity. That's recognizing regardless of one's color, regardless of one's gender, regardless of one's background, that if we want to have a mark that models inclusivity, we have to be like Jesus, who worked with the Samaritans and the Gentiles and the Jews because he loved them all. The Bible talks a great deal about for you and I how to get to heaven, but one of the things the Bible also talks about, and Jesus spent a great deal, is how to bring heaven on earth. And so the third practice, if you want to be indistinguishable from your master as a servant leader, is that you have to model inclusivity because everyone is loved by God, and we need to honor the dignity of everyone. The fourth practice that you and I need to model is to create lifelong learners by arousing curiosity. <laughs> I love my friend, Dr. Ken Blanchard. He often in his talks, and we spend many times together, he'll talk about there's two types of organizations, Tony. There's one type that trains his employees to waddle like ducks. Do what you're told, follow the rules, don't ask questions. Just stay in line with the other ducks and just kind of quack, quack, quack away to all the customers. And then he says, but there's another type of organization, a special organization that actually empowers their employees to soar like eagles. That eagles take initiative. They treat every customer like an individual. They do the right thing in the right way. I just love that analogy. Ken would often say that ego means edging God out, and I would agree with him. But in this case, if we want to have this particular mark, it also, ego also means edging growth out. That transformative servant leaders know that the power lies not in having all the answers, but in asking the right questions. That we create a culture 
that embraces learning from both the breakthroughs and the breakdowns. And that this practice is about enabling you to be the kind of leader who creates a culture of curiosity where great ideas grow. The fifth practice that's so very important if you and I want to be indistinguishable from the master is that we need to expand our inner circle for honest feedback. You see, the danger of any leader is to build a team that functions like an echo chamber, a team of people who are your friends and people who have similar titles as you do. Over time, you begin to hear only the feedback that you want to hear instead of the feedback that you need to hear. You start to believe your own press and live in a bubble from your own hubris. But transformative servant leaders are different. They're committed to expanding their feedback sources to get to the truth instead of a truthiness. Are you with me? As an older, white, retired professor, I realize more so than ever before, I need people to give me honest feedback that are different from me. Different in ages, different from experiences, different genders, different people of color. I need individuals to give me the honest feedback so I can really assess what is reality and what is true. The sixth practice, if we want to be indistinguishable from our master as a servant leader, is that we need to practice humility. We need to practice humility so that we can recognize our own limitations. There really are significant studies in neuroscience regarding the danger of self-glory. Leaders who have the least amount of humility can do the greatest harm. They can cause financial harm, they can lose the loyalty of their team and ignore the warning signs of future calamity. Humility is a genuine sense of being grounded as a person and having an accurate assessment of yourself. Not less than and not more than, but an accurate assessment of yourself before our Lord and our God. My mentor, Dallas Willard, would spend a lot of time talking about this aspect of humility, and he says, if you want to live out humility, do this for 30 days. He said, first, what you need to do is that you need to quit pretending to be something you're not. Secondly, don't push to get the best seats. And third, don't insist on pushing and insisting upon your own agenda without getting all the feedback from the other individuals so that you can know what the stakeholders really think. Don't pretend, don't push, and don't insist. This practice will help you recognize your own limits, keep your ego in check, and resist the false comfort of complacency. The final practice, if you and I want to be indistinguishable as a servant leader from our master, Jesus Christ, is that we need to be committed to lasting change by inspiring a unique vision of the future which means that we have to keep the big picture in mind. See, servant leaders are committed to lasting change, not temporary fixes. And vision is the ability for us to see the future that is invisible to others. That's what Jesus did in his very first words he said in the gospel, that the kingdom of God is here. That was the vision the apostle Paul wanted to create to all the servant leaders that were there, that you could be a person of influence to all those around you that are different in such a way that they can find out a way to live differently, work differently, do things differently, to really live truly human and avoid the dehumanization that often happens in environments. So many times organizations are committed simply to their employees of making money, saving money, increasing production, cutting costs, or solving problems. But we as servant leaders that model Jesus Christ, the desire to be indistinguishable from the master, recognizes we want a bigger picture. We want not only to create profit in organizations, but more importantly, or at least equally, we want to maximize the potential of the people and maximize the benefit of our community or the world or our planet 
around us. Those are my seven. I'd like you to read, I'd like to read to you the words by Eugene Peterson on that passage of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. Listen to this. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. And my closing thought is this. Our salvation is more than a one-time decision. Our salvation is more than a problem to be solved. Our salvation is a story to be told. So my question is, my dear friends, what is the story that will be told about you? Is your life indistinguishable from the master as a servant leader? God bless you and thank you.